Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's talk on data stewards trust and data stewardship. Uh, we have with us Asta Kapoor and Siddharth from Apti Institute. Uh, both of them are going to introduce us with this new concept of data stewardship and why it's being discussed within the data governance circles a lot and how this entire idea of data trust and data stewardship works. Asta? Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's so nice to be here. Um, as Srinivas said, Siddharth and I will take you through uh, what we call data stewardship as an idea of data governance. Um, a few things before I jump into it, um, you know, in terms of a disclaimer, we think that data stewardship is new. Um, it's being discussed but it remains in a certain way at an idea state. So real life instantiations of data stewardship in its different forms are few and far between. Um, so do regard everything that we say as something that is largely at an idea or pilot stages. Um, the second thing is that, uh, you know, this is a very, very large uh, sort of subject. So we will, in the interest of time, be sort of touching upon some examples. We will go through the logic for why data stewardship is important and, and then run you through some examples of, or rather models of how data stewardship can be, um, you know, implemented. What are the different ways in which it's can be uh, or how it can be structured. So that's the, the format of this conversation. Uh, I'll jump into it. Um, so, so, you know, one of the things that we've been hearing as part of this sort of ongoing COVID health crisis is uh, how do we share data better? And we believe that, you know, there's a huge demonstrable value for sharing data and health is one of those sectors. So there's an example that is uh, out of Switzerland called Me Data or you know where which is as you see on the slide um, you, they pull data from various sources they hold it in this me data cooperative and then um, that cooperative is inhabited by the people whose data it is um, and then this data can be used for research and over time for the development of new treatments, health treatments, for instance. So the me data example right now is working on multiple sclerosis, it's working on pollen allergies, it's working on um, some kind of obesity treatments. And the way it works is that you sort of as an individual uh, sign up for the me data platform which is where your personal data is stored. You are now part of a cooperative uh, which takes these collective decisions on you know where the data is going to be used what kind of you know governance mechanisms will be allowed for certain kinds of data and um and then whether there's a value to it etc will also be designed by the cooperative only individuals have access to personal data whereas it, once it goes out for research it's all aggregated and anonymized um and to us this sort of me data cooperative, uh, the way it's structured, which is that it facilitates the sharing of data and it also affords individual certain rights over their data sharing is a data steward. Um, and, you know, it has a huge amount of public value because it allows data to be shared for uh, research for development of treatments over time. Um, it's a very small project, but it is something that exists in the real world. Uh, and now, particularly in light of the COVID-19 uh, health crisis, it is becoming more and more relevant. Another example is in the space of mobility. This is an example that we found uh, in Seattle. Um, in, you know, it's governed by the University of Washington. So what this does is that the centerpiece, which is the Transport Data Collaborative, pulls data from mobile, not mobile, mobility service providers in the city. So, you know, it's anonymized data that is shared by your Ubers. It's largely for two wheelers right now, but soon to be expanded. Um, so it's, it's, you know, Uber, et cetera, other two wheeler providers will share data to the transport collective. And then the transport collective aggregates it, reports it, shares it back with the city. And so it helps the city make better decisions around transportation. It also shares it with researchers 
as well as you know help uh, you know researchers who can then innovate they can you know they can be startups that can help build better options for mobility data um, you know discoverability for individuals and it also allows individuals through the seattle app uh to discover their transit options better so all in all because uh you know the transport data collector is uh you know it it converts the existing data into synthetic data to ensure privacy uh it returns the data to the city in aggregated forms with insights it gives the data to startups and innovators and researchers and it also allows individuals to discover transport uh, options much better so again the tdc in this case is a data steward and you'll see that in both cases there is in in the me data case it's personal data whereas in our personally identifiable information whereas in the tdc it's it can be both personally identifiable information as well as uh, non pii um so this is just a, the two examples for where we think that the steward is useful and it, it its value is pretty dem demonstrable which is that it generates value across uh stakeholders as well as safeguards in the shapes that it exists right now the rights of privacy rights of individuals and communities so just on that but obviously we've seen that there isn't a lot of data sharing and that happens for multiple reasons right like i said there's privacy obviously the societal value of data and that the fact that this value can be heightened because of sharing is not necessarily understood uh, the trust in the process of sharing is is extremely low so right now data is largely shared through data sharing agreements which are often pretty dubious so um, you know there is no mechanism through which data can be shared in a reliable trustworthy responsible manner and data stewardship may be part of that answer the incentive to share is low so you know the government and the private sector don't necessarily trust each other with each other's data uh, the governments are moving towards mandating data sharing which obviously uh, impacts the private sector in the way that you know they don't trust that process at all um, it lies in silos in companies with in the government is disaggregated is incomplete it's also incompatible with different systems so uh, you know that's also another huge disincentive to share data there's a huge amount of friction to do so and again like the overall problem is that there's no framework uh, through which data can be shared safely actively uh, responsibly uh, but there's a lot of conversation that's happening now so you know there's a shri krishna committee which talks about community data it talks about data as a natural resource that needs to be uh, shared um, then there's you know conversation on account aggregators and we'll touch on this a little bit more but it's a regulation to cover data handling and practices for sharing financial data Uh, of individuals with service providers um there's an national data sharing and accessibility policy that came out in 2012 there's more conversation around it um and then there's obviously the mention of community data in the national e-commerce policy and then uh, the committee on non personal data that was also set up last year so the government in india is talking increasingly about data sharing there are it's happening in different ways um and there is an effort to evolve certain kinds of governance mechanisms um certain kinds of definitions of what data can be shared and cannot be shared what protections exist with data that is shared uh, all of this is right now sort of being considered and that's why it's an important moment to talk about okay if we are going to share data then what are the responsible mechanisms to do so and again coming back to that we think data stewardship is part of that answer so just sort of jumping into two important uh, conversations that the government of india is having one is on non personal data now it's not that india is the only place where non personal data is being discovered and discussed uh, the eu in its latest uh, data strategy has also put out uh, you know that there is a need to make data available um, so that there can be innovation so that there is a greater public benefit this is all still in the ideation stage because the strategy came out i guess in april um, or maybe earlier but uh, but yeah there is a sense that there there is data that is in some cases an idea of sovereignty uh, but that you know we need to create data spaces which will be 
managed, which will be, uh, you know, possibly stewarded, but also regard data as a collaborative resource um, and maybe even push into the idea that data in itself, because it's generated by us, by our communities, is a source of commons and should be shared. Uh, India is also similarly, like I mentioned, doing this process of defining non-personal data. We've got mention of community data. We are also looking at thinking about public benefit and questions of privacy, anonymization, governance and accountability still remain uh, unanswered. We're hoping um, that, you know, the non-personal data committee will be able to answer some of these questions. But one thing is for certain data is going to be increasingly shared. Um, then, you know, as I mentioned, there's the account aggregators. These are consent managers for financial data. They've been sort of in the in the realm of imagination since 2016. Um, you know, the RBI has also granted, I want to say, 11 licenses um, is it eight? Uh, to our uh, two companies who are developing account aggregators. But basically, these are, you know, consent managers that move data from those who want it to those who need it. Um, and they are a data blind exchange layer. But again, we believe that there's space for account aggregators to be more than just a data exchange layer. They can be broader consent managers that actually work on behalf of individuals to provide some kind of advisory services uh, on what data should and should not be shared and um, you know actually have a more expanded role as a steward itself looking to actively collaborate share data in a privacy minded manner so that's the sort of broad context of data stewardship but before anything else i think it's important to define it so a data steward sort of sits in the middle of data principles, users, individuals, communities, and provide data. Um, and these individuals and users provide data to the steward and they need to be protected and their rights need to be safeguarded. Data requesters are people who might want data. So for instance, if in the case of the me data example, the researchers want data to push their thinking. So they could be the data requesters. In the case of account aggregators, it's banks from who you may need services. Um, data fiduciaries or holders are people who have the data. So, you know, Uber has my mobility data. So they are data fiduciaries and they will provide users and companies data generated um, so that it can be protected. The data steward sits in the middle of this relationship. So, you know, it works with users and fiduciaries to uh, aggregate data to make it make sure that it's safe for sharing and pushes it out. So these are some of the the sort of responsibilities of a data steward. It actively seeks to, to collaborate. It is the manager of data. It defines the usability guidelines so that data, different types of data is shareable. It's in the same standard. And most significantly, it intermediates on behalf of people and communities whose data it is stewarding. Um, so, you know, it, it becomes a point of negotiation as in the case of me data, uh, it allows people the space to sort of express their own desires or aspirations with regard to the data. I want to share it for this. I do not want to share it for that. It should be shared for, you know, developing vaccines, but it should not be shared for something else that I don't believe in. So it allows for that intermediation between, uh, you know, technology companies that want our data and us. So that it, it's a question of control and collaboration, which is important. Uh, why do it? Uh, why do data sharing through a steward? Well, it is a way of ensuring trust in the data sharing process. Fundamentally, users can exercise more control. You can control the purpose for why data is being shared. Privacy is possible. Otherwise, users invariably have no control over how their data is being shared. Uh, and I mean, it's not that data is not being shared. It's just not being done in a collaborative, transparent manner. It's being done through data sharing agreements between companies which are beyond scrutiny, which are beyond control. Um, and also, as I mentioned, it allows for some kind of connect collective bargaining. So if all of us pool our data with a steward, the steward now has the ability to negotiate, as I mentioned, on our behalf. So for data principles, uh, which are 
people like us, it's a huge, uh, you know, sort of tool of empowerment. The data requesters also, for instance, if Facebook wants our data or whoever else wants our data, it is also usable because there's a reliability quality of data it's efficient because the steward is doing the idea of managing and sponsoring the data in a certain way um, it also reduces the cost of accessing data because you could go to a sort of you know data steward that is looking at i don't know my my asthma data or whatever else so a certain specific kind of data and 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 request it so it becomes the cost of data collection for requesters also becomes uh, reduced um so we think that there are four possible kinds of data stewards this is uh, a not exhaustive list but we believe that this framework manages to capture the types of uh you know roles the steward can play and also the myriad of stakeholders who can manage the access and use in a certain way so i'll explain this is this sort of uh, framework so on the vertical uh, access you have you know who is the data um, accessed and used uh, and who decides the access and use i can do it the self, uh, a nominee or a steward, or a legally defined trustees. And we'll come to each of these models in detail right after. Um, the, the, at the bottom, you have the role of the steward, which is, uh, you know, the steward can just be a data flow mechanism, which is that a pass through, as I mentioned, the account aggregators that just move data from point A to point B, just as a data exchange layer. Um, you can have somebody who stocks and flows the data so you know both is a holder it aggregates it 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 you know it it brings it together as well as allows people to share it or or, or shares it on your behalf and then there's the data stock which is just a sort of data wallet uh, or a personal data store where i can keep my data and then share it as i as I feel comfortable. So uh, in a certain way, the data stock is a very individualized experience, uh, whereas, uh, as is the data flow in a certain way, whereas the data stock and flow is something that allows for that collaboration, collection, and insights. Um, but again, I think that one thing is to keep in mind is that not all data sharing models are equal or data stewardship models are equal. They are defined by why they exist. So, you know, creation of social uh, societal value is a big, big thing. So if you are like me data, you are a nonprofit, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, what Poland disease does not exist in the world. So you are setting up a data steward for that. So the values of a me data are going to be very different than say for instance a bunch of shipping country companies have come together they share their data and that is to generate commercial value from it so their responsibilities are totally different and then the final bit is or to empower individuals which is something like a personal data store that allows me to store my data to control it to monetize it in ways that i think are feasible or important or you know something that i care about so the intent again these are not mutually exclusive categories but the intent is something that defines the governance models more deeply uh, now i'm going to hand it over to siddharth to take you through through the different models of stewardship uh, the ones that we mentioned here to just sort of click out and explain what they are and what they're not. The other thing that I forgot to mention is that the data type is also important because in most legislations, sensitive personal data, personally identifiable information and non-PII are all dealt with differently. So again, that is another thing that defines uh, the kind of you know data stewardship model you would take so you would want to have a highly protective model for sensitive personal information like health data whereas you may not want a highly protective model for something that is of public value that is you know anonymized non-personal such as mobility data so that's just something to also keep in mind um Siddharth, over to you yeah so speaking about the models of stewardship now that is to say uh, when we say models, we're not talking about, let's say, different contexts of governance or even purpose or use cases for that matter. But we're talking about here models in terms of uh, 
the broad design of data sharing, which is to say, um, I think in one of the earlier slides, Asta had uh, described how data might be a stock or flow or both, and also uh, in terms of where uh, the authority or the permissions or the decision making flows from, right? And uh, that's also linked to user consent. But uh, just speaking about the kind of design and the structure of uh, how stewardship happens, uh, the first model that we kind of identified was uh, the data trust. Now, the trust here is the data trust here rather uh, is an intermediary, but not in the not in the legal sense of an interme intermediary with all the baggage that it comes with, but rather a body that is operating on fiduciary principles to share and uh, steward that data for uh, a certain agreed purpose. Now, the idea of a data trust is also uh, in many cases that it is uh, created or set up for a specific purpose. Uh, so the principles or the policies guiding the activities of this data trust would be according to that purpose. Uh, so a data trust set up for uh, medic for medical related purposes, for example, might be uh, designed differently than one that's designed for mobility data and research on that. Uh, and uh, so those those are the policies that would be tailored according to uh, the purpose of that data trust. But suffice to say that uh, the idea here being that the data trust operates on fiduciary uh, principles and is taking decisions. Yeah, uh, it takes uh, decisions on, uh, in that sense, it has the control of decision making of sharing this data further as opposed to the user having direct control over it or it being uh, directed by any other third party. Can you switch to the next one? Uh, now, the next is data collaboratives. Uh, the idea here, and also uh, in our analysis, this is kind of analogous to what are, what are generally known as data exchanges. Uh, the idea here being that data is pooled by third parties. Now, these third parties might come together in terms of just a horizontal contract, or it might be a collaborative in the sense of so one of the organizations has data, the other organization doesn't have data, uh, but rather is focused on usage of data in certain ways. And these two organizations might collaborate or it might be uh, a closed link uh, contract where a few parties get together in order to share data with each other for some kind of collective benefit. Either is either uh, both, both kind of examples exist in the world. And um, but the purpose of these can uh, the purpose of these could be uh, a lot for uh, varied kinds of either public or private benefit. Uh, for example, in terms of a data exchange, uh, I might be a company uh, engaged in a certain sector of business, let's say, and I find it useful to share my data with a few peers who are also engaged in that same business. And we have some kind of collective benefit from that arrangement. Now, on the other hand, you, it, a collaborative might also be a situation where you have a municipal entity which is working with uh, a private company. So it's some kind of public private partnership, let's say. Uh, so that kind of situation where uh, the municipal entity is using uh, some kind of uh, aggregated data and such uh, for uh, po either for policy making or just for executing its functions better. Uh, that kind of uh, arrangement would also in its larger design fall into uh, a data collaborative or, or a data exchange. Uh, the, now the account aggregator model is, I think something we came across mainly because it is something that has a lot of uh, policy, existing policy tools in India as it is. And it also has uh, a certain, uh, a certain uh, prominent example in Europe through the X road system. And in India, we have the account aggregators as is. Uh, so the RBI uh, released uh, regulations on account aggregators that kind of set it up in this uh, design as well, which is to say that the uh, you have a central steward in that sense, aggre uh, aggregating sharing controls. It, ha it, um, it aggregates the information on which users uh, ha have consented to share the data with which third parties. Now, in the Indian example, if we're going to go into that, uh, 
these are known as uh, financial information users and financial information providers. Now, as the name kind of suggests, the providers are the ones who have that data and the request and the data requesters, as Asta kind of explained, are the financial information users. Now, sitting at the center of this is the account aggregator controlling the protocols on sharing and consent. So the idea is that the end user, which is the customers, uh, interact with the account aggregator and have consent controls on what data I shared with which third party. So if I have some data, uh, if I have some data with a certain service provider, let's say by either my telecom service provider or, uh, or my financial service provider, I have some data with them, uh, which is pertinent to me. I might choose to let them share that data with another third party, let's say an insurer or a medical health provider or a, or, or a, or, a, or somewhere where I need to get a license using certain information that I need to provide, uh, I could choose to share data with this third party through the account aggregator. Uh, I, the idea is also that the account aggregator provides protocols and, and uniform standards uh, for data sharing among, amongst these third parties. And But there are certain differences of design, which for example, um, the account aggregator model in India, for example, only requires uh, direct contracts between the steward and the third parties. Uh, whereas uh, the European uh, model, which is XROAD, requires contracts between all three third parties individually. So if I wanted for in that earlier example, to share my financial data from one third party to another, I those two third parties uh, would uh, need to have uh, a contract between them. I mean, there are also other differences, which is that in in the Indian example, the user is only given the option of consent and nothing else, and and the requests are made by the third parties and not by the user, uh, which is also which in some ways is also the case uh, in the X road example, except there is less user control over that and it's more direct, a common platform for da data sharing. Um, yeah. So, and the last one is uh, personal data stores. Personal data stores are the model which kind of give users the most control. Uh, over here, the, the sharing and policies are kind of, uh, to a certain extent, uh, the controls of course are uh, tailored by the user and uh, the policies are kind of designed so that uh, third parties approach uh, the steward uh, to access data for whatever purpose they may need. And these purposes are kind of made available to the user as well. So the users have a bit more, have, have greater control over what aspects of their data are shared and uh, for how long it's shared and uh, uh, consent revocation, uh, which, uh, which adds a lot to user uh, agency essentially. And these models are, uh, so a few of these models exist in terms of a solid uh, project started by, uh, I think, uh, started in Europe and, um, we have, and I do, and, uh, I think a few examples of, let's say the Apple wallet loosely would, uh, fall into this as well, where the users basically have control over, uh, what data sets are shared and how. So that's the four models. And, uh, in our report earlier this year, uh, and, Hopefully we should share that later, but it's called uh, understanding data stewardship. And this is, it's where we've gone into depth of all these models along with analysis of examples of each model. Uh, we outline certain uh, early principles or, or an early understanding of principles uh, on which uh, data stewardship should kind of function. And uh, some, and we've mapped them out here in a, in a kind of early understanding of it which is to have some uh, kind of uh, participation and representation, of course, which is just what I touched on in terms of user agency and user control over their data. Because the idea of data stewardship is, of course, uh, to move away from a model of, um, I guess, third parties having a model of data sharing where users have no expression or no uh, participation in terms of how they are being affected by this data sharing, right? The idea speaks to uh, how users relate to the data, their data in very kind of um, very real ways of, or very consequential ways, and uh, and how it's how it's shared uh, should be a bit more easily controlled or uh, at least a bit more uh, visible. Nothing else, uh, and that's and that 
relatedly speaks to representation as well, which is to say that user, uh, it's all well and good to have that information, but uh, you need to have some kind of uh, control over it as well. Uh, and these models kind of have different ways of making it work. For example, a data trust may not give you as much uh, direct agency or direct control as a personal data store. Uh, but uh, but you can design a data trust uh, so that it works for certain specific purposes that uh, that are aligned with the interests of users. And uh, speaking and a bit more on the governance aspect is the accountability and transparency, which is uh, which I think which I would say applies across models uh, because uh, the trans the transparency is a matter of. Uh, again, just again, it, it's linked to accountability, but just the users knowing what's happening with their data. Uh, and accountability also speaks to our, uh, modes of uh, redressal and grievance redressal. Uh, it's it mat it matters in terms of how it's regulated, or the laws, or the policies governing it. How do you enforce those po policies? Uh, because uh, I think a question that we did not address. Uh, majorly in our report, but we are, I think, thinking through now uh, is the question of how do you design the governance principles for these uh, entities? And I think that speaks to uh, larger principles of data protection, uh, larger principles of um, accountability in data sharing, right? Uh, I think that speaks to other debates as well on privacy and on participation and, and public accountability. So these are questions that we kind of intend to address going forward as well. Uh, and yeah, this is, this is kind of what I've been talking about here uh, in terms of user participation, in terms of the structure and uh, design. Uh, something I could touch on more a bit more is uh, now is conflict of interest, which is to say that, uh, so one of the uh, arguments that we've received, for example, when we've kind of spoken about this idea of data stewardship is, that you're just introducing another point of failure in the system, which is, I think, a fair criticism to say that you have all these companies that are sharing data in unscrupulous ways. What's to say that the data steward is not going to do the same? Now, the obviously, the idea of the steward is to, again, reorganize this pattern of data sharing. The idea of the data steward is to uh, give some expression to users and provide more strength to user rights. Now, the data... Now, data protection principles already do that, uh, attempt to do that to some extent. Of course, in the Indian context, we don't have them codified yet in terms of uh, what's enforceable. Uh, but the principles of data protection uh, do uh, are very heavily uh, linked to user expression, whether it's in terms of deletion of personal data, whether it's in terms of modification, uh, whether it is with or, or just uh, pure transparency measures in terms of notification, right? Being notified, the entities with whom your data is being shared, being notified about uh, what's being shared or why it's being shared and what exactly is being done with it. All of those things speak to transparency and uh, and those are things, and these are interests that need to be aligned with the idea of the steward or with the purpose of the steward pardon, because uh, the idea of setting up the steward needs to be that um, for, a, for, the perp for a purpose that has some public benefit, right? Uh, for, for that's the, the entire idea behind um, using data for good or for public good in that sense uh, is something that is kind of relevant here. Uh, and in order to do that, you you make sure that the business model and the financial models for the steward are not designed in a way that the uh, the intent of stewardship gets compromised. And that's a very important kind of structural design and a governance question that uh, that needs to be always kept in mind. Uh, and, and lastly, on um, sector and data type specific stewards. So the idea here is that this is a design question or a government or yeah, it's, 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 um, it's, it becomes, it, it becomes an important question legally and structurally because you may want different kinds of regulations for different sectors. Uh, you may want different kinds of regulations based on what kind of data the steward is handling. For example, if it's handling highly sensitive personal information, you may want to regulate that differently from data collected from, let's say, speed guns in public places, for example, that, that data might be viewed differently than sensitive personal information. Uh, the idea is to have uh, stewards that are geared towards specific purposes. 
And just to sort of end with the fact that this is very much, uh, you know, it, we are at the exploration stage. Uh, we are, as Siddharth mentioned, starting to answer ask and answer some of these questions uh, and also finding um, examples of uh, instantiations of different kinds of data stewardship models. So we've got uh, a database that we keep adding on and will soon make public. We are also writing, uh, you know, a couple of papers or uh, on one on obviously this basis of data sharing itself like how do we think about data is it commons is it sovereignty is it just contractual um and and then also on as i have mentioned on the conflict of interest um we are trying to think about what possible revenue models can exist for data stewards such that they are sustainable um but also not necessarily uh, you know making money of the data that they are stewarding and are responsible for. Um, so that's, um, and so these are also questions that we would love to discuss with the group um, and, or, you know, and, and will also hopefully present uh, work in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Asa. I think there are a couple of questions that have already come in, but if you are on YouTube or watching it live elsewhere, please ask your questions on the chat and we will uh, point them to Asta. Uh, to start with, I think there's one question from Divij. Divij, I think I can unlock, uh, unmute you. Do you want to ask a question directly to Asta? Uh, you're allowed to speak now. Um, sure, thanks. Yeah. And thanks for that presentation. I just wanted to ask um, if there are any standardization efforts around these protocols. I mean, I know kind of a lot of this thinking is very preliminary right now. Um, but has anyone tried to think about, you know, how these protocols could look like from, uh, from technical sides? What kind of, you know, data entry fields might exist, even in the case of, say, simply financial data sharing or data stewardship um, protocols? Um, I don't, I mean, from what we've learned so far, they don't necessarily exist. Everybody sort of, there's no collective protocol at all or standards or uh, any model that's experimenting with this kind of data sharing through uh, a sort of intermediary or, or, or steward is, is developing their own protocols around it. Part of our effort is in, uh, in, this, in, in this research is to actually align some of these protocols and, and build up what we are calling the principles of a good steward so that it's something that anybody who's building a data steward can ascribe to. This will include uh, technological protocols as well. If I could uh, just say something about standardization. I think, I think we're at the point of standardization of, I think, the models themselves right now, or even the structures around those models. I think uh, the kind of institutional structure uh, that carries out these functions, I think is where we're at in terms of just kind of fixing on a common idea because there's because I think majorly uh, what's being discussed is data trusts are discussed a lot and we have account aggregators here. We have data collaboratives, which are kind of a significant idea in their own right. So, and these kind of overlap to different extents with each other in terms of their function, in terms of how they're governed, in terms of uh, just uh, how prevalent they are. And, 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 and to take up a little, to kind of take a stab at the technical aspect, uh, many of these initiatives are, Private, uh, are small projects in the sense of pilots. Uh, yeah, either pilots or even just uh, entrepreneurial efforts in that sense. And, and, and the nature of such uh, efforts is also that it works in a proprietary manner. So you have uh, your own kind of setup, which works for even for data for good, right? Even for data for like helping some kind of public purpose. Uh, you have your own protocols and controls for it when you, when it's a startup or when it's an entrepreneurial effort. Uh, so that's the stage for a lot of it at speaking from a kind of, I don't know, uh, a top down approach of standardization. I think we're at the stage of uh, agreeing on the concepts and principles right now is what I would say. Hi, uh, so I think it's sorry, uh, do you want to add more Asta? No, we can move on to the next one. Okay. 
Cool. Uh, to the, we have one question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, he's asking, are you looking at data trust the same way of Wendy Hall's report of thinking about data trust as a way to develop artificial intelligence? Uh, I think this is uh, in relation to the uh, UK's parliamentary report, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, as far as data trusts are concerned, sorry, uh, Asa, you, you want to take this? No. Okay. Uh, I think it, as far as data trusts are concerned, we are looking at that for sure in terms of just giving it context. Uh, I, that was a useful kind of pointer to see how data trusts are operating. And I think it is relevant. It's extremely relevant because the idea of data trust there is yes to kind of reorganize data sharing for purposes of public good. Now, I think it's important to kind of note that there are different like uh, uh, political forces at play here because it's, it's kind of, you have, you have all kinds of regulations and you have all kinds of political efforts trying to regulate data. It's, I think it's important to look at that context in terms of things like the digital tax and stuff. And this kind of is contextualized in a larger, uh, politics of uh, data protection and data sharing in that sense. But as far as uh, the idea of data trust is concerned, I think it is definitely a useful uh, formulation of that idea, which you'll find in those UK reports, parliamentary reports. Uh, I, and I, and based on that, uh, the open data Institute is also uh, done has done and is doing uh, some good research on that aspect as well on how to kind of just look at data trust. And, and like I said, it's an evolving conversation. So now they're looking at how to build, so to speak, data institutions. Uh, and, and I'm not completely clear about what the divergence of both of those things is, but the idea being that you have an institutional design uh, that is able to uh, reorganize data sharing for public good, right? And, but yeah, just to answer the question in short, it is uh, relevant. And, and uh, as I, I think we, we may diverge from data trust in terms of that report, because I think um, the, that report, uh, the, uh, the idea of that data trust is obviously coming from some kind of uh, very much a top down legal perspective uh, or a, or a state perspective in that sense. But I think we, I think what we look at uh, as a data trust is a governance layer based on fiduciary principles. Yeah. And just to add to that, I think that it's important to note that, uh, you know, a lot of these um, sort of data stewardship models, whether it's collaboratives, exchanges, trusts, even, uh, you know, account aggregators, what all of them are, have a bunch of different interpretations um, coming from different parts of the world. Uh, and, Part of our effort has been in some ways to align uh, and, and, and sort of harmonize some of those definitions. So uh, the report that Siddharth mentioned actually relies on a lot of existing work and is an effort to find ways in which we can uh, align the taxonomy through a study of the use cases. Uh, so Wendy Hall's work, ODI's work, also the work of you know scholars such as Sylvie Delacroix and Neil Lawrence who've written a fabulous paper called Bottom Up Data Trust, which is really, really useful and, has, and, and the work of Sean McDonald, um, including also the works of people like Bianca Wiley, who have been, you know, sort of at the forefront of that uh, citizen resistance against a certain model of data trust that was being Im imposed by sidewalk labs, um, are, or have all helped inform our understanding of uh, what we think are possible principles for uh, responsible data sharing. Uh, there was one question on how do you consider Aadhaar here? Uh, do you think it is an aggregator or a personal data stock? Would would Aadhaar fit the personal data stock? But uh, I guess uh, there are issues of governance or uh, mm -hmm. control that UIDA provides to an individual, right? Yeah, we would not regard it based on our definition that it is a personal data store to us. It is a digital identity as it is for a lot of people. Uh, but uh, yeah, we would not regard it as a personal data store. Sifat, what do you think? 
I think in terms of personal data store, I think what's more analogous to the idea is the DigiLocker, uh, which which kind of gives your which which gives the user more uh, control over what's how that data is used and shared. Uh, though I I'm not fully informed of how it, the project works. Uh, I think Aadhaar is uh, is more of a identification project from what I'm seeing it as and. And it's less. It's. I don't think it's linked uh, inherently to the idea of data stewardship the way I see it. Okay, I think that's it. We have one last question of uh, by Preeti, who's asking us, "What is the threat of big tech like when it comes to data sharing?" How can one circumvent their influence? Is this something that can go into the thinking of data governance in policy making? So the question is, uh, who, who? Okay, I think the question is rather who is going to build these data uh, models, right? Like, would it has to be the private sector, especially the big five: Google, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, uh, or Amazon, or? Can it be the government, or can it be, say, even a citizen collective? Like, we we haven't seen any citizen-led data trust, have we? I mean, most of the examples that you you put involved, uh, which were pushed by the private sector or by the government. Yeah. So I think that, and maybe Siddharth and I disagree on this, but I think that there is space enough in this uh, data sharing, you know, space right now for different kinds of trusts. Uh, or not trust stewards uh, for different kinds of uh, purposes. So, you know, it's possible that you do go to um, a, a health data steward that's working on, as we mentioned, me data, that's an entrepreneurial effort or a nonprofit that is working on research. Uh, you know, you may choose to also go to a data steward that actually, um, and this may be a problematic assertion, but it just is that allows you to commodify your data and draw value from it. You may also go to a data steward that is willing to negotiate on your behalf. Uh, and I think that different functions of the steward uh, will define its governance and who builds it. Um, and, and, and I think that there is um, a huge amount of space uh, and something that we would love to explore and see, uh, which is already being discussed is the idea of, you know, these data cooperatives, these data unions that are stewards that negotiate on your behalf and are community built and community led in a certain way and negotiate on your uh, on your behalf uh, as a way uh, a citizen representative would do. Um, and, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, finish. No, I was just going to say like, and, and I would not believe that big tech uh, should be building this in a certain way because there's a huge amount of obviously conflict of interest that cannot be resolved. Um, also, I think that, uh, as we mentioned, a lot of the answers and questions on sustainability are important to this. Um, how does, how is the data steward made sustainable is important. And we've been exploring, um, you know, ideas such as you know, stewarding of the commons in the way that Eleanor Strom talks about. Um, and is there a way that if data is indeed considered as commons, um, is that a way to think about sustainability? There's another possibility of thinking of data as, you know, labor or union, uh, and then considering data unions as part of that. Uh, and then finally, uh, if you think of data as an asset, then, um, then maybe the role of financial intermediaries and the way that they charge commissions on transactions could be something that, um, something that can be considered. So uh, I think that, as we've been saying, there's a, you know, there's a question on sec the kind of sectors, what kind of questions you're answering for. The, the specific purpose of the data steward is, is, is also uh, something that can govern this. So, um, was yeah. Uh, so just to kind of the question of um, whether big tech should do it or who's going to do this, uh, I agree that there's... Uh, there's a problematic element of of a conflict of interest, which I think needs to uh, be sorted 
uh, every time you are setting up data uh, data steward in that sense uh, but i think there is overlap of these principles of governance and over, or on the specific versus the specific task of data sharing and how to do it uh, now data sharing a lot of projects are being taken up in terms of either open data or otherwise uh by uh, by in that sense big tech companies uh but i suppose the what's required for a robust steward is polit- is the political will behind it uh, to kind of create it which is why you have a lot of discourse in uh, in places like uh, the uk and and canada uh looking at these structures of data governance because i because i think there is uh sig- there is a certain um political will for it as well because it is it it, it is very much aligned with an anti big tech or an anti uh, us centric interest which i think is relevant in this debate so i, I mean yes i in, to to answer that question shortly i think i think yes there is space for uh, that kind of perspective to be relevant uh but i also think that there is the important question of incentivizing data sharing and when you're trying to walk that fine line between incentivizing data sharing and empowering users uh you need to show value and you need to show um benefits being accrued uh, to these users in order to make it a viable suggestion uh venkat had a question is going on hey um uh, thanks for the presentation actually it was very insightful um when i look at it from the perspective i i swim in this data world and uh, the implications of this uh, trusts are actually pretty um uh, profound um so related to that uh, if you a couple of questions one is that um, uh, where is this conversation happening today right and um, uh, whether it is in india or elsewhere uh, who who are the people at the table as of as of today second uh, <coughs> when i look at it uh, from the um, again from the trenches uh, there is uh, in most uh, uh, market seem to be oligopoly market power that can be uh, if the existing players for example let's say ola and uber get together um price fixing is the you know simplest thing that will happen right so um the conflict of uh, interest transparency and some of these things uh, are uh, uh, very hard problems given the monetary incentive for uh, coordination of the data and sharing of the data that exists today any any uh, thoughts on uh, the first one uh, where where is this discussion happening um, uh because a lot of details have to be worked out and second um, uh the uh this uh, whole uh, focus on conflict of interest i i heard something but i i worry a lot because uh, you can obfuscate in you know any number of different levels uh yeah i can take the con- uh, question on um you know where the conversation is happening um i think you are right it's largely driven by a certain kind of you know west um as of now but we see that increasingly um you know the idea of sort of appending data governance in a way that it empowers uh people um and gives them more control is something that we've you know noticed happening in 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 different parts of the world whether it's you know india south asia africa so i think that uh, i think that it's important to to start to think of these bottom up mechanisms of data governance which i think is an opportunity that data stewardship provides and um you know sort of offer alternatives to um how we've been thinking about data whose it is who controls it how it's shared um and who draws value from it so i i think that increasingly the i think the broad basing of the conversation is happening the models are something that we have to consider for ourselves uh, wherever it is and they need to be in some ways localized and contextualized um so that so that the governance of the so that the governance can be something that makes sense for um 
at a lower level in a certain way so that i think is and just on the conflict of interest i absolutely echo your concerns uh, i think that these are questions that need to be considered more deeply there needs to be uh, you know there needs to be a few things that come together in terms of alternative revenue models there needs to be a governance check there needs to be a political check uh, to make sure that the that the data steward remains true to what its main function is which is to you know represent uh, individuals or communities and and sort of intermediate on their behalf so i i i absolutely agree that it is it is a huge concern and towards the so that mentioned earlier that it is it does have the risk of just creating another sort of mount of power um that is uh, that has access to your data so uh, i i think that i mean just to iterate that that's something that we are very very acutely aware of and considering uh, deeply as well so did you want to add to that um the only thing i think i have to add is just on term, in terms of that question of just who has a seat at the table in that sense i think that's a very relevant question uh i think it's it speaks to a lot of what we've been discussing or or a lot of what we're looking at right now in our research in terms of uh just the governance and institutional design for the for data sharing right uh i think you you can have any of these models and all of them may work all of them may fail but i think what really paints uh success or failure for any kind of data sharing project is uh the intent and the where the where the kind of um where the power lies in that sense or or where the political will is coming from or where the uh, controls over the data sharing or where those um where the design of how data shared is coming from and who gets to design that and who gets to say that uh, i think these are all uh, very fundamental questions before even entering uh the specific question of data sharing for that for that matter even data collection as is as 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 it stands today i think these are also relevant questions right uh and yeah and and i think it's something we've tried to caveat because this for example what we've spoken about today are our models of data sharing in terms of the design of or the patterns of sharing rather and i think what we always try to caveat is that these are uh, these need to be kind of ensconced in solid governance models and solid uh, principles respecting privacy respecting uh, user rights respecting um you know these uh, principles of conflict of interest and public interest uh and uh, and i think it speaks to what the previous question brought up as well that, that these are all institutional and uh governance questions that need to be uh, always kept in mind while designing these processes uh i think i get to ask you one last question so often these ideas are discussed in silos right like i mean we're talking about how to store data simply or how to share data is how do we store share and how to govern it but often if you look at the institutional hierarchy say in take the case of the account aggregators itself rbi has been a closed institution for a really long time it doesn't matter who the government is for their own independence and that's the way the institution has run so when you look at uh, implementing any of these models at any of the existing organizations you tend to uh take the baggage of the existing organization's policies right it's not like uh, you, you can't suddenly undo them you inherit them so where would one look at placing these inherent issues when something like this is designed right like i mean you you could be bringing i think the try is trying to work on something similar uh, uh with tele phone data right they're, they're trying to share some of these uh, data sets or become a data trust in itself so try on the other hand i i like is a really good transparent institution which actually brings in a uh, uh, years worth of experience right so when you look at rbi versus try both of them fine institutions in their own respect but they have different kinds of policies so what would you think when uh, uh, 
a different uh, ecosystem or a different uh, data model comes into play in different ecosystems uh, do you think the ecosystem will have those issues because the governance structure has those issues absolutely <laughs> I, I think there's no escaping the baggage that the institutions come with, which is why uh, we're trying to flag these institutional questions as being relevant. Uh, I think I think the idea behind bringing data stewardship, uh, at least the most benign way, or the most benign kind of uh, motivation for bringing this into the public realm is to reorganize how data is shared than the, to tackle the various problems that already exist today regarding you know power concentration regarding privacy and how those two problems are inherently linked to be honest uh, and 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 sure there are other problems like uh, like policy making and, and so forth uh, but there is no escaping the institutional uh, baggage that we have even whether nationally or transnationally and I think, yeah, it would be remiss to uh, ignore that and just uh, bring in a kind of what we see as this ideal, all loose ends, tied up model, uh, which really isn't the case, right? Uh, I think you need to. I think you need to start from the questions you are asking, Srinivas. I think you need to start from uh, the institutional uh, nature of how data is already being used and shared, and. And I think you need to modify that to uh, bring in these principles of, uh, you know, fiduciary responsibility of bringing in these uh, user controls over sharing and, and users being informed of what's being done with their data and purpose limitation, uh, you know, right, uh, the right to delete your data and, and control and duration controls and such. Uh, and these are things that are I don't know, very basic and, and we need a data protection law in the first place uh, before we can start really meaningfully talking about designing data sharing systems, right? Because what is what is a data sharing system without data protection principles? It's, it doesn't mean a lot. Uh, so, so I, I, yeah, I mean, there is no, I, I don't think there's a question of ignoring uh, existing institutions. I think we need to look at uh, how they operate and modify them. Uh, yeah, Asla. Yeah. No, I just wanted to add that absolutely agree with, um, you know, what Siddharth is saying and also with your question, Srinivas, like we get into this knowing that it is a difficult place with a huge amount of friction, with a huge amount of baggage, but also to what Siddharth was saying, I think the starting point is also a huge amount of, uh, you know, user information and awareness on what is possible, where are the controls, and then as we were saying, like building up certain kinds of bottom up governance mechanism where they are possible. Um, that might sound a little bit uh, utopic at this moment, but, you know, a potential data protection law does give users certain kinds of rights and those rights can be a way of solidifying um, more more equitable, more sort of, um, you know, more responsible methods of data sharing, uh, which then over time lead to a certain kind of empowerment that we are imagining. Uh, thank you for that. It was a lovely session. Uh, I hope anyone else who has questions can reach out to you separately. But on that note, I had this uh, comment. I think there will never be a perfect uh, data store whether it's trust, personal data store, or whatever you call it, uh, the institutional politics or conflicts of interest and accountability issues will remain. Uh, and we will have to strive to ensure that it will be fixed over time. Thank you, Asta. Thank you, Siddharth, for joining us today. And we will end the session now. Thank you so much, Thank you guys. So much. Thank you.